Rob Harder just winked at me. I fear I am in danger. <laughs> good morning. And it is a good morning. Beautiful weather, a church full of people, and a potluck, and a missionary report. This is truly uh, the Lord's day. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis 1, and we're going to look at verses 26 through 31. And as we always do, once you have found that portion, then I would ask you to stand in reverence for God's holy word. Genesis 1, 26 to 31, and these are the words of the Creator God. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth. And every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth... Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And may God bless the reading of his word. The series that we are on this summer is a little different than our normal diet of just sequential expository preaching through the book of Matthew. We're taking a break for summer. We'll be back in Matthew. And the series that we've been on, called The House for My Name, is so named because it is concerned with looking at what is God doing in his creation. What is the purpose of the institutions and the things that God has baked into creation? What is he teaching us about himself with the world that we live in? We are a living temple, and there's these important pieces. And so the first sermon had to do with the glory of God, which is the most important thing uh, that we can conceptualize. Because uh, all things are from God, through God, and back to Him. And then we looked at the church, and you'll see these messages are all interrelated. There's not one that's a standalone message here. Uh, God's mission for the church, for Christ to take a bride at His side to complete His mission uh, in this world. And then we have a lesser echo of that in human marriage. And that's where we are at, is looking at masculinity, looking at femininity, and then finally at marriage. And I think we frequently get this upside down, where we think that it, you know, it's like God looks at the things that we do and then he responds. Oh, these people, they made up marriage, and that's kind of like how Christ and the church works. So I'm going to use their idea of marriage to get through to them. Not at all. That's backwards. That's upside down. Logically prior in God's mind is the church, is redeeming a people for himself. And then out of that, he has determined to make man and woman and marriage as an echo, as a reflection, looking back at that. And when we talk about these things, in our culture, when in anything to do with gender or sexuality, this is how books and sermons typically go. The teacher will apologize for 20 minutes for everything he's about to say. He will half-heartedly talk about it for five minutes, and then he will spend 15 minutes apologizing for everything he just said. Okay? Because we have certain sensitivities in our culture, certain taboos that Christian leaders are not allowed to break. And so this morning, I don't want to over or underemphasize anything. I want to stay between the biblical guide rails. I do not want to be misunderstood, but I also refuse to make apologies for anything that the Bible teaches. And some of it will cut against the grain. Let's be okay with that. The goal of the Christian is to have no problem passages with Scripture. So it is in that spirit that we want to talk about these things. Some of you may have heard of a popular feminist from the 1960s and 70s by the name of Kate Millett. She wrote a book in 1970 called Sexual Politics, which set the world on its end. It was a manifesto on how women can use their sexual power to recreate the world. Kate Millett died a number of years ago, and her sister Mallory Millett wrote a piece 
on her sister in Front Page Magazine. And she titled the article, Feminism's Ruined Lives. And this is from Mallory Millett, sister to Kate Millett. It was 1969. Kate had invited me to join her for a gathering at a home of her friend, Lila Karp. They called the assemblage a consciousness-raising group, a typical communist exercise, something practiced in Maoist China. We gathered at a large table as the chairperson opened the meeting with back-and-forth recitation like a litany, a type of prayer done in Catholic churches. But now it was Marxism, the church of the left, mimicking religious practice. Why are we here today, she asked. To make revolution, they answered. What kind of revolution, she replied. The cultural revolution, they chanted. And how do we make cultural revolution, she demanded. By destroying the American family. How do we destroy the family, she came back. By destroying the American patriarch. They cried exuberantly. And how do we destroy the American patriarch, she replied, by taking away his power. How do we do that? By destroying monogamy, they shouted. And how can we destroy monogamy? This is Mallory Millett speaking. Their answer left me dumbstruck, breathless, disbelieving my ears. Was I on planet Earth? Who are these people? By promoting promiscuity, eroticism, prostitution, and homosexuality, they resounded. They proceeded with a long discussion on how to advance these goals by establishing the National Organization of Women, now. It was clear they desired nothing less than the utter reconstruction of Western society. The upshot was that the only way to do this was to invade every American institution, everyone, must be permeated with the revolution. The media, the education system, universities, high schools, K through 12, school boards, etc. Then the judiciary, the legislatures, the executive branches, and even the library system. It fell on my ears as a ludicrous scheme. As if they were a band of highly imaginative children planning a Brinks robbery. A lark trumped up on a snowy night amongst a group of spoiled brats over booze and pot. To me, this sounded silly. And it was. And you know what the wild thing is? They've won. <laughs> as wild as that scheme is, temporarily, they won. They pulled it off. How did they do it? And why does this hellscape that they have created start to seem natural even to Christians? Sometimes, when people hate something or someone so much, they harm it in effigy a voodoo doll to get at the person you really want to get to, perhaps a target that you take to the gun range and shoot at it because you can't reach your real target. So you must have a lesser effigy of it. Those who hate God cannot get up to slap him in the face. So they must resort to harming its effigy, its image. And that image, as we read in Genesis, is man and woman. Ultimately, what is behind all the sexual perversion and confusion of our day, what is behind the madness of transgenderism, what is behind feminist, masculine women and soft, careless, lazy, effeminate men, whether they know it or not, is a cosmic war against God. The sexual revolution is a proxy war against the God of heaven himself. And a revolution simply defined, and if you've sometimes heard me, maybe in Sunday school, that revolution is always necessarily sinful. Why do I say that? Well, because revolution is always necessarily sinful. Revolution is concerned with destroying the old ways, rejecting the old paths, moving the ancient landmarks, burning it all to the ground, and ironically is incapable of building anything positively to fill its place. But a revolution is a rejection of the wisdom of ages past. It's burning it all down. And so this morning, when we look at something like masculine glory, we need to remember that we are doing this as people, please keep this in mind, who are already 60 years deep into this project. And for most of us, this is the air we have been breathing our entire lives. And we're entirely unaware of how deeply this has influenced us. And before we go further, I want you to do a thought experiment with me. Think of how many ideas are floating around in your head that seem obvious to you, 
that are not at all obvious in a biblical conception. We do catechism training at Trinity, and this is the classical way to teach children the faith, is question and answer, repetition until they understand it. But catechism happens whether we're aware of it or not. I grew up in an age of sitcoms. That's what was on TV when I was a kid. And we had lots of seemingly family-friendly sitcoms. We had The Cosby Show, Family Ties, Growing Pains, all these shows. And now as an older man, I look back and realize how those shows were catechesis. They taught my young mind through repetition. For example, every time the dad in any one of those shows wanted to take charge of his family, take responsibility and lead, that's when the laugh track comes on. Ha, 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 ha. I was learning through catechesis. I was learning through repetition that it's a joke when men lead their families. It's a joke. That's when we laugh is when men take responsibility. I was being catechized. For those who came a little bit after, think about Disney movies. And there's basically one plot for a whole lot of Disney movies. And it goes like this. There's a free-spirited young child, often a girl, who wants to be free from any bounds or any kind of creational limitations. And then there's this traditional father who tries to keep her grounded in reality. And how is resolution achieved in Disney movies? Resolution is achieved when dad caves. When dad realizes that his young teenage child has far more wisdom than the accumulated wisdom of the centuries, of the ages. That's how it's resolved. Dad caves to the whimsical notions of a creative child. We need to zoom back and, and realize what assumptions do to us, realize the training that we've had, intentionally or unintentionally, and look at the biblical conception. Male and female are God's creative work. And so his design and his instructions for gender must be ultimate. It must be unrivaled. God's word is not one authority among several. It's the ultimate authority. God's world, God's rules. All the time, with everything. And even in so-called conservative Christian circles, we often make compromises with the revolutionaries. And I've said this before, but sometimes people who hate the Bible are more honest about what the Bible teaches than compromised evangelicals. Evangelicals feel this need to obey scripture. And when obedience starts to look tough, we get into these very creative Greek and Hebrew studies. Right? All of a sudden, we become gymnasts the way we do theology because obedience looks hard. And I'd rather do a Greek study and say, well, that's not really what the text says. People who don't feel the need to obey scripture can just say straight up, the Bible teaches male headship. The Bible's a patriarchal book. And, and ha, ha, ha. And I want to say, let's be honest. What does the Bible teach? We want to obey scripture, even the hard parts. <clears throat> so we're not wanting to blend the world system with what the Bible teaches. We want scripture to guide. And so this morning, we want to look at the story that God is telling through masculinity and femininity. And I want us to be honest about it. The Bible and the sexual revolution offer diametrically opposed views and compromise is not at all possible. I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but in the 1930s, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Neville Chamberlain, uh, heard some bad stuff was happening in Europe and particularly in Germany. And being the peacemaker that he was, the, the man who's looking for a third way that he was, he flew over and met this new German Prime Minister and negotiated a settlement with him. And he came back and proudly told the English people, we will have peace in our time. And there was a brash young parliamentarian by the name of Winston Churchill who said, Mr. Chamberlain, you went there and you had the choice between dishonor and war. You chose dishonor and you will have war. <laughs> okay? A conflict is coming. And you can either go into that conflict compromised with your head down in shame because you're a compromiser, or you can just say, this is what it is. And go in with your courage. Go in with your dignity intact. But a conflict around gender, around sexuality, around the family is inevitable in this culture. Let's go in with honor rather than with dishonor. And so when it comes to the most obvious scriptural teachings on Roles for men and for women, for male and female, passages like Ephesians 5 or 1 Timothy 2 or 1 Corinthians 14, it's pretty much impossible to get out of what those things teach about a man and a woman's place and what we're designed for in the home and in the church. 
So we, we obey those most obvious things, and this is good. But there's an important difference here. If we start with the assumptions of our culture, and we just assume an egalitarian world where men and women are more or less interchangeable, and then we see that male leadership in the home and in the church are kind of like biblical exceptions to the way reality actually works, we're going to end up at a very different place than if we start with the assumption that gender actually matters across the board. God's doing something with gender everywhere, okay? And so what the Bible teaches about men taking leadership in the home and in the church are not exceptions to reality. They're important examples of reality. And this leads us down a very different path. So what the Bible says is not exceptions, it's examples. And we know that gender must be about far more than reproduction, Because God has baked into creation many ways of reproduction in plants and even sometimes in animals that don't require specific differentiated male and female. The Bible never bases its arguments for gender roles on the fact that men are smarter and that women are uneducated and women are not capable public speakers. It doesn't ever do that. Scripture bases its arguments on design, on creation, in God's purposes. And so remember, because gender is about teaching us about Christ and his bride, about Christ and the church, Gender, fundamentally, is symbolic. And many people hear that word and they think, oh, so it's not real? Uh, And that's not quite it. Symbolism does not mean that something isn't real. Symbolism means that real things mean something. Okay, very important difference. (laughs) Symbolic stuff means that real things have a meaning. They have a purpose. They're designed to teach us. And we saw that God made male and female, gave them marriage in order to give us a real-life role play so we could understand Christ and his mission with the church at his side better. So again, I really want to emphasize, we don't start with egalitarian assumptions and then try to make it blend with the Bible. We start with the Bible. God's creative design starting in Genesis. (coughs) A world that is fundamentally egalitarian, a world that doesn't see difference and glory and contours and things, particularly in God's image bearers, is a world that is bland and boring. And egalitarianism in all its various forms is bland for this reason. Think of the architecture of medieval Europe versus any public school that was built in Canada in the 1970s. Beauty versus blandness. Monotony. Boring. No meaning. No symbolism. No glory because it's all been leveled in our mindset. Think of Soviet architecture in the Soviet Union relative to the Eastern Orthodox churches that were built a century before. One shows glory, one shows meaning, one points us to heaven, and the other is gray and boring and square. Feminism works the same way. But God has made a world with day and night, water and land, fish and birds, farmland and mountains, male and female, and this is both interesting and beautiful. It's glorious. So again, starting with a biblical and creational view of things, of masculinity and femininity, we see a world rich with meaning. We'll see the story of Christ and of his bride, of self-sacrifice and beauty. We'll see that the reason we've enchanted ourselves through the ages with stories about knights, dragons, and princesses is because all of these stories are real. They're the original, and all our lesser stories are the copy. The story of creation, fall, redemption, glorification, the story of Christ coming to redeem a bride, so that together, side by side, they can rebuild a glorious kingdom from the ruins? This is the original template for all of our lesser kill the dragon and get the girl stories. In other words, male headship in the home and in the church, again, is not an exception. It's an example of how this works. But this means that male headship and male responsibility are everywhere. It's across the board. Look closely, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 5. We're all familiar with Ephesians 5. You might have missed something. In Ephesians 5, 23, you'll see that it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Notice closely, it doesn't say that the man ought to be the head. It doesn't say that it's ideal and things will generally work better if the man is the head of the home. He is the head of the home. 
So this passage isn't just an instruction. It's a description of objective reality. It is (laughs) this way. Like gravity. Because God has made men to image the masculinity of Christ, men cannot opt out of their headship. And if a man attempts to opt out of his responsibility for those around him, it's not that he ceases to lead. All that happens is he's leading poorly. If a man says, well, I guess I'm the head, but I'll delegate all headship, all responsibility to my wife, this isn't abdicating headship. It's leading poorly. And you'll quickly notice that in homes like that, the most obvious feature about them is that everybody is frustrated. Everybody knows they're sweeping water uphill. (laughs) And the minute they stop, it's going to revert back to nature. Everyone's frustrated working against nature. Well, what if a man decides this is all too much? I'm crushing under the load. I'm going to get on a jet and I'm going to fly to Las Vegas and party and never come back to see my family again. Has that man opted out of his headship? Not at all. Because you know what rules that family? Is an intense father hunger and an empty table at the chair. He is leading. Okay? Young men, old men, you cannot get out of this. You cannot escape it. You are leading. You are setting the pace. You are. You're going to do it well or you're going to do it poorly, but you are doing it at all the time. And this is like gravity. You cannot escape it. The inevitability of this shows up in the most strange places, if you think about it. It shows up in the elementary school classroom. It's no secret that given our method of education, and that's, we won't get into that, that's another topic for another day, but the way we do education, boys frequently fall behind the girls in the classroom. And because these little boys are made in the image of God, they know something's abrasive about this. There's something upside down that the girls are dominating here. So what do they do? Either they tend to feel helpless and, well, there's no point, and they become passive and emasculated. Or they'll find destructive ways to take charge once again. And this frequently takes shape in the place of paper airplanes and spitballs. Okay? It's boys reasserting their dominance in a destructive way. Men are leading. Always. No exceptions, nor can there be. Okay? You're going to lead constructively or you're going to lead destructively. You're either going to be a pirate or you're going to be a Puritan. <laughs> okay? But you are leading. You are leading. You're building or you're destroying but you cannot get out of this. And this is a great place for us to pause for a moment and point out something important. When you zoom out all the way to give a scriptural explanation for the way the world works, one thing you will frequently find is that people don't even understand themselves what they're doing. Okay? When those little boys start making paper airplanes because of their frustration, they don't understand, oh, it's because I'm made in the image of God and, and I'm supposed... That's not what's happening. People frequently do things by instinct because they're made in the image of God, but they don't even reflectively know what they're doing. They don't know why they're doing it. They're just doing it because if you hold an inflated beach ball underwater for long enough, as soon as you let your hands off of it, it wants to come up. Okay? We can suppress these things, but the, the image of God wants to come out even if we don't understand why or how we're doing. So, when a young boy stands on a diving board and calls attention to himself and then does something risky, he has no idea what the cosmic meaning of this is. He's just doing something that he's wired to do. And you'll know this if you're a parent and your little boy comes out and everything is a sword or a gun. Right? Where's the bad guys, Dad? Where's the bad guys? I'm going to go get them. And the little girl comes out and everything's a baby that needs love and kisses and to be tucked into bed. Okay? That's the image of God. Why would we suppress that? It's beautiful. It's glorious. Why would we try to pretend that that's somehow a construct of culture. The construct of culture is trying to suppress that and not see beauty in it. I'm reminded when our children were very, very, very small, we were at the in-laws for lunch, and it was wintertime, and there was a bit of a snowball fight that happened, and I guess I had tagged Tanya a little bit too well with the snowball. And I had a three-year-old son who unbuckled himself faster than I've ever seen, and he came at me mad. <laughs> That's the right instinct. He thought his mom was in danger. Okay? And he did what the image of God says he must do. Use his strength to protect a woman. That's good. That's right. Don't discourage it. 
Don't make fun of it because it's cute. Little boys are training for manhood. Don't make fun of them when their voice cracks. They're training for manhood. Don't make fun of them when they do something important poorly. They're training for manhood. <laughs> Encourage it. Encourage it. And mom, I know you don't understand why it's a good idea to do really dumb things and pound a Tonka trunk into a wall. If you've ever been a boy, you understand why it's a good idea. <laughs> Encourage him. He's learning how to lead a family. He's learning how to be a church elder. He's learning how investments work. He's learning about sports. He's learning about reality when he's playing rough. Another one of our children, after a family gathering, when things were going as nature would dictate, at her bedtime prayers, after this hunger gathering, said, Dear Jesus, thank you so much that the girls played so gentle and that the boys played so rough. I thought, man, this kid gets it. <laughs> this kid gets it. And all the little cousins also get it without being taught. So male headship is inevitable. Men are designed to image Christ, and this law is as fixed as gravity. And the minute you think you're beating it, all that's happening is that you are on your way to a rather messy encounter with reality. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Being watchful and standing firm are how we are to act like men. And so for good measure, Paul adds that acting like men includes being strong. And this is consistent with the whole description of masculinity in Scripture. It takes strength to stand against the stream. It takes strength to stay awake at night and pray for your children who are not walking with the Lord. It takes strength to pour into your church body and your family when you yourself are playing hurt. It takes strength. Okay? And I'm not talking about being six foot four and muscle bound. That's also glorious. But for strength to show up, it shows up in many different ways. I'm not just talking physical strength here. It includes that, but it's more than that. It takes strength to be kind and patient with your wife when she's not acting particularly lovely today. It takes strength to obey God when it's going to hurt, and you know what's going to be painful. And these things are the duties of all Christians in one sense, but it is the glory of men to lead the charge in doing this. And men are like highway tractors. We do run best when we're under a load. Okay? You run best when you're under a load, men. Okay? So don't give in to the selfishness and the self-indulgence of saying, I'm going to go solo through life. You're not designed for that. Ask any truck driver. They don't like to bobtail. They like to pull something. Everything goes better when you're working. Proverbs 20, 29 says that the glory of young men is their strength, but the splendor of old men is their gray hair. And the reminder of this passage and the passage of time is a poignant thing for men. When you see an old gray-haired grandfather with his little grandson holding his hand, there's something poignant, there's something romantic about an old man's memories and a young boy's dreams. Okay? And this is exactly as God designed it to be. Something right is happening when young men are training in their masculinity at the hands of older men. 1 John 2.14 says, I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and that the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. And bad things happen when young men pool their ignorance and try to give each other sage advice. If you've read your Bible, you'll know that after Solomon dies... Left to take his kingdom is his son Rehoboam. And the Israelites make certain requests of Rehoboam when he becomes king. And he says, let me think about it for a couple days. And you know how the story goes. Rehoboam could have gone to his father and his grandfather's old advisors, the men with the gray hair, and he would have learned something valuable. What does he do? He goes to his friends. He goes to fellow fools. People who are just as ignorant, just as green, just as experienced, and frankly, just as stupid as he is. And he listens to their advice. And all it costs him is everything. All it costs him is a civil war. That's all it cost him. Okay? He should have listened to the old men. Who did he listen to? The fools, his peers, the guys he was hanging out with. And it cost him everything. His cost was the kingdom. But today, many young men are cut off from a future of blessing and of honor by also listening to the foolish advice of their peers, rather than going to the old men. And one thing I have frequently noticed, and you might have noticed this too, this is true in my own experience, and I watch it, 
And I think it's generally true. You know the guy whose life is the least in order? (laughs) The guy whose family isn't in order? The guy whose finances aren't in order? He's the first one to give advice to the 17-year-old boys? Why is that? Okay, I've had some terrible advice from someone who had made a hash of everything in his life, warning me against marrying Tanya, uh, warning me against starting a farm and every blessing that God has given me in my life. Why? And I think it's a form of... Either this guy thinks he's crushing it when he's not, or I think it's mostly a form of compensation. (laughs) My life's a mess, but I'll at least feel like a man if I can tell a young man what to do. Okay? So frequently, the old guys that are happy to give advice or a little too eager to give advice are guys that don't have their own families in order. They don't have their own business in order. (coughs) But God's glory is the starting point and central focus of everything. Again, all lesser glory in the universe is a reflection of his, since all things are from him, through him, and for him, to him. And the glory of masculinity is the glory that comes from accurately portraying the masculinity of God, the masculinity of Christ as he faithfully and gently husbands his church. Men are glorious when they reflect the strength that they were designed to reflect. And so woven through scripture from creation on, we see a pattern of what men are for. Men are to build, fight, protect, and lead. Build, fight, protect, and lead. And the glory of men is their strength. Scripture is clear on this. It is what they do with the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual strength that God has given them. And this requires courage. C.S. Lewis says that courage is not merely one of the virtues, but it's every virtue at its testing point. It's every virtue when it's hard to obey, when it's hard to tell the truth, when it's hard to be faithful to your wife. That's the testing point. That's where courage matters. And so biblical masculine strength is the commitment to virtue despite the pain, despite the suffering, even to the point of death. Biblical manhood is constantly watchful and steadfast in the faith. And courage holds the line, standing fast when everything around you seems to be falling apart, when it doesn't look like it's working. And this masculine courage fundamentally trusts in Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. And either he's going to relieve the difficulty or he is going to resurrect you from the dead. But either way, you're in good hands if your trust is in Christ. The worst that can happen to you is you die. And if you're a Christian, you will be resurrected. So spend your life productively. Masculine courage shouldn't be hard to find when we understand a Christ, a masculine Savior who showed the way from the grave. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 It reads, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, and I'm reading from the NASB here, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. And so frequently, the Greek words here have all been melded into one word. Many English translations merely say homosexuality at that point. And there's several words in the Greek that are happening there, arsenikoites, but also the word malakoi, which means softness. And many English translations just collapse it all into homosexuality, which is true enough as far as it goes. But it misses something. It misses the fact that effeminacy, apart from the homosexual act, softness in men, is a serious sin that will keep men out of the kingdom of heaven. Effeminacy is softness in men, particularly at the very places where we are called to be hard and strong and courageous. And sometimes this is just simple cowardice and fear, like running away. But that trembling, especially in the face of battle, the Bible describes, and notice this is where the Bible is not so politically correct. This is where we transgress the culture. When men flee in the Bible, they're said to be acting like women. Isaiah 19, 16, Jeremiah 48, 41, Jeremiah 49, 22, and 51, 30. It talks that way. Men are built for testing, for courage at a certain point that a woman is not designed for. And the softness can also be a confusion of glory, seeking the glory of a woman through inordinate care and concern for appearances and luxury. Deuteronomy 22, 5, Matthew 11, 8, and Luke 7, 25. This is the guy that's priming and you know, making himself all proper in front of the mirror. And most guys, I think, just have a natural gut reaction against vain men. Why? 
Why? Because you're made in the image of God. <laughs> okay? And men are not to be looking in a mirror. Men are to be looking to Christ for their glory. Okay? So if something bothers you about vain, soft men, I'd say that is the image of God. You know you were designed for something different. The Bible says that woman is the glory of man, and this glory is her beauty and her beautiful way of cultivating life. Genesis 2 and 1 Corinthians 11. And this is why it is right and proper for a woman to glory, for example, in her long hair, and it is shameful for men to give undue appearance or attention to their appearance. 1 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. And the softness in men is not at all re- unrelated to the confusion about sexuality in our day. And so we must practice strength and encourage men and teach it to our boys. We have to teach this to our boys. Okay? Don't try to, to snuff out the masculine instinct in little boys, even if you don't understand it, mom. Okay? It needs to be trained. It needs to be discipled. It needs to be sent on something constructive rather than destructive. But don't snuff out the masculinity of a young boy. He's training. He needs to be guided, not discouraged. Soft men are a scourge and a curse on the people of God. And this is why God would rather have Gideon lead a small army of courageous men rather than a large army of cowards. And how many times in the Old Testament do the leaders of Israel tell their army that anyone who doesn't believe in this, anyone who wants to go home is free to go home right now? Jesus goes through a similar culling process in John 6 after giving some very hard-edged teaching about the sovereignty of God and salvation. And the people are murmuring. Jesus says, if you don't like this, go home. If you can't man up for the battle, go home. We don't need you here. In verse 66 of John 6, we read, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Jesus also calls crowds. Okay? Jesus also calls crowds. If you don't believe in the mission, quit pretending. Get on the mission. If you're here, get on the mission. And so while we certainly do have a plague of sexual rebellion and confusion in the world driven very often by soft men in the church. We should not miss the fact that men can often disguise their softness as strength. God calls men to use their strength obediently, and this means taking responsibility and choosing obedient sacrifice. God created Adam first so that he could be cut open first. Man was made first so that he might bleed first. Men love courage and heroism, and so they do not usually embrace pure cowardice openly or immediately. Instead, many men will choose disobedient sacrifice and then try to pretend like it's a form of suffering, acting like victims. But this is just cowardice masquerading as courage. So a man may go hunting or work on the car instead of pursuing his wife, or training his children, or starting a new business, or a school, or a church. And by the same token, sometimes a man does need to go hunting or learn to work on his car and get out of the office. But the point is responsible obedience. Just doing hard things is not enough. The hard things must be obedient to Christ. So when God lays Adam down to open him up and take a bride from his side, this was, no doubt, I'm sure it was hard for Adam to sacrifice himself. But had Adam offered instead, well, I've got that automatic transmission in my old cutlass that needs rebuilding, and that's hard. (laughs) I'm going to go rebuild a transmission because that's hard. That's not the kind of hard task that he was commissioned with at that time. He needed to give himself for a woman in that moment. So just doing hard things isn't the test. Doing obedient hard things is the test. And because there's such an incredible emptiness in men and a loss of purpose in men in our culture, because masculinity is often treated like a disease, young men especially are prey to counterfeits. And they'll grow up knowing that something is missing in the way they've been taught. And they'll know that somehow feminine piety, feminine holiness looks different than true holiness. And you see this all around from first wave feminism and the women's temperance movement and and just everyone folding your hands and being a good little boy versus the untamed holiness of God. Okay, True holiness looks like three tornadoes in a row. Holiness looks like thunder coming off a mountain. Holiness is not tame. And these boys know instinctively that feminism offers little in terms of explanation for the world. And then frauds like Andrew Tate come along. And it looks close enough to the real thing that they might be drawn in. And thankfully, there's also more mature voices out there, people like Jordan Peterson, 
I don't know if Jordan Peterson is a Christian yet or not. But even if he is, he's come from a background of secular pagan Jungian psychology at a secular university. And he's given some very good practical advice that I would wholeheartedly agree with. He tells young men to stand upright. Put your shoulders upright. Look people in the eye when you're talking to them. Give a firm handshake. And walk like God's given you something to do. And that is good practical advice. And I would say yes and amen to all of those. When I worked at the feed mill in Otterburn, I was in our production manager's office and some guy came walking across the road for an interview for a production job. And the guy I was with there, he looked at him walk across the driveway and said, well, I guess this interview is a waste of time. Why? Well, he's walking slow. <laughs> he's automatically out. He's a slow walker. We don't have time for slow walkers. <laughs> I want people who want to do something working for me. Okay? So men, I would say this practical advice is good. Stand upright. Look people in the eye. Speak intentionally. Walk like God's given you something to do. That's part of your calling. But in all this, I wonder, where have the pastors been? Where have the Christian fathers been? This has happened on our watch. Where have we been? The fake masculinity of men like Andrew Tate is self-serving and self-indulgent. And these guys use women for their own pleasure instead of using their strength to build, fight, and protect and lead for women. And this is just another kind of softness that looks tough on the outside. But men who love the mirror and who refuse to use their strength properly are effeminate. Andrew Tate is an effeminate coward. Yes, he's cut. Yes, he's shredded. He's a coward and he's effeminate because he loves the mirror. And he loves using women instead of loving a woman. He's a coward. He's not who you follow. He's effeminate. And one way that you see this show up, this is so obvious when you think about it, weak men are hard on those around them. Strong men are hard for those around them. This leads in very different directions. If you're in love with the mirror or if you are in love with Christ, following him. King David fell into his trap right before his sin with Bathsheba. The Bible says that it was springtime when men are supposed to go to war. And David should have been leading from the front, leading his army. But here he was in the comfort of his own home, leading from behind, leading from the rear. And his self-indulgence and his comfort led to greater and greater self-indulgence, which led to adultery and a civil war in his own family. And so effeminacy comes in various forms, but it is always marked by softness. Femininity is a glory when it's found in women. But in men, it is marked by self-indulgence and mirror-gazing. Self-righteous man prides himself in following man-made rules and looking at the mirror at his own obedience. The indifferent person who doesn't care who he's offend, abusing his Christian liberty, is also busy looking in a mirror, serving himself. Masculinity is about putting your strength to work to bless others around you. Masculinity takes responsibility for others. It takes trouble for others when weak fools and effeminate are making the trouble. Biblical masculinity is the glad assumption of sacrificial responsibility. And the last passage I want to look at is Proverbs 31.3. Everyone knows about the Proverbs 31 woman, but before that, the king's mother, King Lemuel's mother, takes her little boy, and she's probably seen a thing or two in her day, how things work. She takes her boy aside and tells him this. Sonny boy, do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. Okay? It would be outrightly neglectful to talk about masculinity this morning without acknowledging the weakest spot in almost every man's armor, which is his sexual energy. The desire for sex is in itself a good thing. It's an instinct from God. But just like other instincts, it has to be trained. It has to be discipled into the obedience of Jesus Christ. So man's strength is to be used to build, and caving in to sexual temptation kills. It makes you weak. It makes you soft. The Proverbs warn many times about how a man is brought to nothing when he gives his strength away rather than uses it to obey Christ. Samson gave literally everything away in exchange for sex. And this is what sexual sin always reduces to. An offer of fake respect from a woman in exchange for empty pleasure. Real respect is shown in commitment, loyalty, obedience, encouragement, praise, and service. A wife swears to honor and obey a man in the Lord, which makes men stronger. And so women, if there's something for you here, do you want to make your husband stronger? 
Honor him. Respect him the way he's designed to be respected. You will make him stronger. You will make him more loyal. You will make him more obedient to Christ when you honor him rather than nag at him. But by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. Proverbs 6.26. In 1 Kings 11, we read of Solomon's many wives and concubines and how they turned his heart away from the Lord. And we know about the glory of Solomon's temple that he built for the Lord. But we also read that he built high places and shrines for the pagan gods of his wives. In exchange for sex, think of how much of the Lord's money, time, and capital got wasted on idolatry. How much harm did this cause not only in Solomon's family, but for the whole nation that he was to lead? And I'm going to offer that there's a mysterious dimension here that I'm not going to push too far because I don't know how it works. But it's been true in my own experience and it's been true in the experience of men I've talked to. A mysterious element to our inescapable headship is that when men struggle with sexual temptation, when they cave, when they're looking at pornography, when they're giving their strength to women who don't respect them, even if your wife never catches you, even if your wife isn't hurt by what she's seen on your phone or in your stash, she's going to struggle somehow. There's going to be an undescribable sadness or weepiness or something bothering her that she doesn't even understand. And it's not because she's mad at you, because she doesn't even know. There is something about this providentially that God sends these reminders. And I don't know how this works. I don't know how straight a line it is. But when it's happened, this is a great reminder to put sin to death in your life. Okay, to lead your family well, to give your strength to Christ and then honor one woman rather than waste your strength on fake women. So if you're a man, you are either a potential patriarch or you are already one of your own little tribe. What are you building? Don't despair if you're suddenly seeing wasted resources. Christ died to forgive sinners, including cowards. Christ died to forgive men who have already given their strength away. And so once Christ has pardoned you, then man your station and do things that will build a potent tribe in the kingdom of God. Lay down your life for your woman and your children like Christ did in order to build his kingdom. So to bring it all around, to summarize here, God made men to reflect his own masculine strength and glory. And as a result, it is a non-negotiable fact that men are always leading with no way to opt out of it. We will either lead like Adam, who left his wife unprotected, as Tim read this morning, and thus, by his weak leadership, cast the entire human family into ruin. Or we will lead like Christ, who remained firmly committed to making his bride beautiful by taking her back, no matter her failings, forgiving her and cleansing her when she falls. And how often do we men follow Adam instead of Christ? Adam makes himself out to be the victim when his wife fell. And how many of you can hear your own voice in that? God comes to the garden, and Adam, what have you done? And he's, well, this tree and this woman, and and I'm the victim here, God. I'm the victim. (laughs) You gave me this woman. You gave me this tree. I'm the one you should all feel sorry for. But God goes to Adam and says, this is on you, man. You didn't protect your wife. This is on you. I'm cursing you for what your wife did. So what Adam should have done. He should have taken Eve by the hand, gone to God, and said, Lord, look what we did. I'm sorry. This happened on my watch, and I'm responsible. Please take my life and spare her. And how do we know that Adam should have done that? Because that is what Christ did do. And all this makes our mandate much more clear as men. We're leading at all times. It means we're setting the temperature at all times. This isn't an occasional act of bluster. This is an ongoing culture, conversations we're having in our families as we lead our wives and children, our churches and our businesses and our communities. We can't opt out of this. Wherever we go, we're responsible for how we're shaping it, what we're contributing. And this also frees us from the desperation of heavy-handedness or putting your foot down. And I'm afraid that many people, when they hear words like complementarian or patriarch or male headship, what they think of is heavy-handed male bluster. Some lazy man sitting in his chair barking instructions for his family, and not at all. Okay? The lazy man all of a sudden sees he's got a big mess, and then he's tempted to put his foot down. Okay? If you have to put your foot down, you've already failed. Because okay? things got out of control on you somehow. 
You don't put your foot down. You lead. Start bleeding for your wife. Start bleeding for your kids. Then they'll respect you. Okay? If you're going to sit up on your throne and bark at them, you're going to see responsibility and authority just vanish before your eyes. You will not be able to grasp it. Start bleeding for them. And good things will happen. And we often hear about servant leadership. And this is good in the sense that it reminds us that male headship is not about heavy-handed authority and bluster, but about protecting and promoting the best interests of those around us. But this can go too far and give the impression that we're doing a good job of leading when we just do what everyone tells us to do. Christ leads from the front, and Adam and David and Solomon lead from the rear. So we're not to be the kind of leaders who never make a decision, and even if we did, no one would care because we have no respect in our homes. So when you hear a phrase like servant leadership, be reminded, men, that we do not lead by serving. We serve by leading. You're serving your wife when you lead her. You're serving your wife when you are a brick wall protecting her from what's outside. Men, you serve by leading. That is your service that you render to your family. And this isn't bluster. This is bleeding responsibility. And if you're doing this well, you are always getting input and counsel from your wife and from those around you. Okay? So only a fool doesn't seek counsel from those he's leading. But it does mean once a decision is made, it's on you. It's your decision. If you say you want to go to a restaurant and your wife would prefer a picnic, and then you discuss it and you agree her idea is better, we're going on a picnic today, and then it starts raining, here's what you're not allowed to do. Well, it was your idea. No, 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 no. <laughs> we decided I wear it. It rained on my picnic. Okay? That's headship. That's responsibility. You can't blame your wife. That's Adam's stuff. Do Christ's stuff. Take responsibility for problems you didn't create. And women are sinners too, surprisingly enough. And we're going to look at sins common to women next week. And so it may be that if you're in a hairy situation, your wife may have very well helped to create it. Maybe even the majority of it. But biblical masculinity sees the difference between being at fault and being responsible. If some ocean liner, you know, the captain's asleep and some lesser ranking guy slams it into an iceberg and crashes... It's his fault, but it's the captain's responsibility. Okay? Men, if your family's out of control, it might be her fault, but it is your responsibility. Fix it like Christ. Okay? Take trouble on your shoulders like Christ did. A problem he didn't create, he's taking it on himself. Adam tries to offload it onto others. And as you do this, you're going to notice something. Authority naturally flows to those who take responsibility. Plenty of exuberant young men want to become leaders in church or in civics. They want to demand the respect of their families and their communities. But if you start by grasping at authority, it will always slip through your fingers. Authority is not something you grab. It's something bestowed on you by others when they say that you are willing to take responsibility, that you're willing to bleed and die for them. And so when they see that you are truly following Christ, willing to give your life for theirs, you're willing to bleed and take pain on yourself to make their lives go better, you will find authority naturally coming your way. So don't be grabby. Start bleeding. And if you're unmarried and thinking about the kind of woman you want on this mission, or if you're married and you're unhappy with the kind of person that your wife is becoming, run a simple thought experiment. What kind of a woman do you want on the mission? kind of woman do you want? Okay, now you've got a picture of her. Now ask yourself, what kind of a man does that woman want? Start being him. Start being him. Be the kind of person that the kind of person you want to marry wants to marry. Okay, if you want a glorious bride who's going to help support you on your mission and encourage you, put it into practice. Okay, start leading sacrificially. She's not attracted to a lazy fool who's sitting on his throne barking orders. She doesn't want that guy. So you're not going to get that kind of woman. What kind of woman do you want, young men? And then start being the guy that she wants. The glory of young men is indeed their strength. And the perfect display of masculine strength is Christ himself. A man who took trouble for others. He is the perfect example that we ought to follow as we gladly assume sacrificial responsibility. Let's pray. Father God, 
Thank you for glory. Thank you, first of all, for your own glory, that you have been so pleased to be God. You are so filled with love and glory and holiness that it has spilt over into creation, and you are telling a glorious story in this creation. Lord, first, with your rescue mission, with your son, Jesus Christ, and the bride that he takes to himself, and then the way that you have given us male and female in creation, and you've given us marriage to help give us a real-life role play of what you're doing in your creation. Lord, help us to see not just the details of our marriage, but what our marriages mean, what manhood means, what womanhood means, what masculinity and femininity are for, and how they're glorious, how they point us to the glory of who you are and what you're doing in your creation. Lord, and I pray for every man in this room, from the little babies crying in the back to the oldest gray-haired saint, Lord, help us to be courageous. Help us to bleed. Help us to push through the pain and be courageous and bless others around us, our wives, our children, our church, our community, our coworkers. Lord, give us masculine strength. Give us courage to know that our job is to reflect the glory of your son who leads from the front and who leads sacrificially. Lord, I pray that you would be glorified in the way we practice our manhood at Trinity Fellowship and beyond. Thank you for your kindness. And we commit the rest of our time of fellowship into your hands as well. Pray this all in the strong name of Jesus. And amen. Please stand.
receive the charge with believing hearts. The glory of men is their strength. Men were made to do hard things. Men were made to bear heavy loads. When men work out physically, they get stronger. When men push themselves to do more, they generally get better at it. It's trendy in our world, even in our Christian world, to warn one another about burnout and overdoing it. But where in the Bible are we warned about that? The Bible certainly does instruct to take a weekly Sabbath, a day of rest. But beyond that, it says that we are to be known for hard, diligent work. And it warns us against sloth, laziness, and cowardice over and over. David fell into sexual sin in the springtime when kings are supposed to go out to battle. So where is the battle that God is calling you to? Is it dealing with sin in your life? Is it leading your wife or your family more intentionally? Is it starting some new venture, a new project? Does it look hard? Will it require suffering? Might you mess up along the way? Men, you were made for this, and this is your glory in Christ. And receive the benediction from 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. And go, well, stay <laughs> in peace. And young men, you have a great opportunity to set up chairs and tables here and take a load off the ladies. So get to it. <laughs>